So I moved to San Diego in the summer of 1998 after spending my junior high and high school years living on a small military base in Japan. With living overseas came a certain sense of detachment from American culture, especially in the mid-90s, pre-big internet, and without some of the normal pop culture avenues like cable TV. I was a gawky skateboarding misfit <coughs> who would discover weird, noisy, punky music through magazines and the like. And every year or so, my family would travel to the States for vacation, and I'd record late night MTV, watching these tapes over and over after I returned home to Japan. Eventually, in all of this, I discovered a handful of great, noisy, weirdo punk bands here in San Diego. So when my family decided to relocate here after I graduated high school, I was excited about the prospect of being around and being involved in an arts and music community. So I moved here at 18, got an apartment, started taking classes at Grossmont Community College, started going to shows at the Shea Cafe over UCSD, one of the only officially sanctioned all ages venues in town. It had been explained to me before moving here that San Diego as a city doesn't particularly take much interest in supporting the arts community. <laughs> Considering that it's largely both a beach town and a military town. So a place like the Che was a haven for me. My favorite bands touring through town and playing a small room to all the weirdo punker kids here. In the following years, there would be coffee shops and a couple of other bigger places that would try their hand at having all ages shows, but it wasn't always met well by the city. My first New Year's Eve in San Diego, I went with some friends to a warehouse space downtown that some people lived at. Somewhere around Union and Maine, which I guess from here is like a straight shot that way a little bit. <clears throat> and this was before the ballpark came in and cleaned up the city. So it seemed like a thousand people roamed this space as bands played inside and people skated to half pipes outside and people lit fireworks, everybody partied. It was like Shredder's Lair in that first Ninja Turtles movie and it was fucking awesome. <laughs> Over the next few years, proper art galleries and warehouse spaces would open up downtown, hosting bands and art and providing an opportunity for those communities to gather and enjoy the freedom of expression in a safe place. But then his plans for the ballpark were put in place, the city started cracking down on these spaces, forcing, the, forcing them out and upping the rent. Condos and hotels were going to be built. Downtown was going to change to cater to big money interests. And fuck the punks, who needs them anyway? So in this time, I moved to South Park and spent a majority of my time hanging out just up the road in North Park. Most of the people in the local bands that I liked, they all lived in the area. And every weekend, there were parties and there were house shows. Bands playing together, artists showcasing their work in spaces that were still plenty controlled, excuse me, never unsafe. So at the intersection of 30th University, there was Scolari's office, a piss and puke smelling rat infested bar that housed the best in outsider music, and it was fucking glorious. I was being snuck in before I was 21 to see bands, and it felt like another new home. Everyone welcome to make whatever weird noise they wanted to. Down the street was Shooters. It was a gay pool hall that every Thursday hosted a massive 80s night dance party. And around the corner was Buster Daly's, a sports bar by day and punk kind of hip-hop bar by night. So we might have been pushed out of downtown, we thought, but at least we have this area. The thinly veiled racism of outsiders who couldn't imagine spending time in scary central San Diego kept anyone who didn't know better at bay. Sure, I mean, plenty of things happened and crime existed, but in all my time hanging out in the late hours in North Park, I never personally saw anything major. Us weirdo art kids, we enjoyed the existence of cheap bars and cheap rent and plenty of venues to watch and listen to music. This went on for a while, and somewhere around 2007, local music John Reese, music legend, excuse me, John Reese, most known for being the chief songwriter in bands like Rock from the Crypt, Pop Snakes, and my favorite of those noisy bands I heard in high school, Drive Like Jehu, who would reunite in 2013 and play to 4,000 people in Balboa Park. John opened up the Pink Elephant, now known as Bar Pink, in the middle of this North Park intersection. It was bigger than the other bars nearby, cleaner, a faux swinkier veneer of kind of gaudy pink everywhere. It was just as cheap as the other bars, and now there was a bigger venue for bands to tour through and play. 
another, another place for the artists and musicians in San Diego to congregate. So I started my first band with my best friend, and then we started another band, and we'd play these places and these house parties, and it felt like a perfect fit. A new scene was developing, weird lo-fi, punky stuff. Our friends were starting projects. Suddenly there was national attention. My band's party house in North Park was included in a Rolling Stone article about how San Diego was the hot underground city of the US. And the biggest music magazine in Sweden, Sonic, ran a profile on the scene here. So my band signed to a pretty known garage punk label. Uh, a lot of our friends were signing to big labels as well. There was a general excitement in the air. Things were happening in San Diego music in a big way. So people from around the country were wondering what was happening in town and why it worked so well for musicians and artists. And I'll tell you, it was North Park. It was South Park and Hillcrest and Golden Hill. Central San Diego had transformed into the breeding ground for an underground arts and music culture. And suddenly all the bands that used to skip San Diego, who thought this city was a dead zone, they started coming through town again. But then something happened. As all this ex excitement was growing in 2009, as we thought that the city was finally making something of itself in the music world for the first time since the early 90s, when we had the intersection of 30th and University to call our sanctuary, the beach people showed up. <laughs> Specifically, the owners of PB Bar and Grill, who came in and saw packs of kids hanging out at Bar Pink and Scolari's and filling the streets. Shooters was two doors down from Bar Pink and had just closed. And so those owners of PB Bar and Grill, they bought the space. And they opened up True North. The worst sort of douchebag sports bar in the middle of all of this. The complete antithesis of everything everyone loved about the area. Suddenly the people we were happy to avoid, the people we thought could stay on their own turf, the beach bros who thought North Park was too weird, they were here. They were showing up to our shows. They were making fun of us art kids. They were pissing and puking in our lawns. Fred Scolari, the, owners, the owner of Scolari's office, died around this time. So as the influx of PB and downtown ties began hanging out in the area more, investors saw potential for capital. Scolari's office was renovated and opened up as the office, a take on a downtown club. Buster Daly's closed and was bought out and reopened as U31, another pretentious downtown type club. North Park was officially gentrifying. And since that time, I've been watching this happen in quick succession around the country. In Brooklyn, Williamsburg was an off-limits warehouse district that housed a few artists, musicians, live workspaces that also doubled as venues for bands. And suddenly the area was hip and could be capitalized upon, and companies started moving in. Swinky restaurants opened up. Developers started buying out previously condemned properties and turning them into luxury apartments. Does this sound familiar? This kept extending through Brooklyn as people kept showing up, displacing the former residents to make way for new business opportunities and newly raised property values. And then this started happening everywhere. The upper middle class whites who fled those urban areas for suburban homes were starting to move back into those inner cities. Detroit began, at, began advertising itself as a city in need of an artist boon, giant homes and offices for sale for almost nothing. And with the artist, there followed the big companies moving right in alongside them. In San Francisco and now even Oakland, the artists and musicians who'd lived there so long and loved the city were put out as the techies from nearby Silicon Valley started moving in and buying out apartment buildings and tripling the rents. Seattle has been experiencing the same thing. Now even Portland and Austin, which seem fucking untouchable, are being stripped of the former weirdo artist culture as big business moves in. As breweries are opening on every block, as the Philistines take over these areas, does this sound familiar? So the faces of these cities are now dramatically altering in the face of capitalist consumerism 
the colonization of developers with their eyes strictly focused on potential financial gain, who could give two shits about the cultures that these cities have been built on? The capital powers to be figured it out that after the white flight from urban areas in the early 70s, it was the artists who stuck around those areas with the residents. It was the artists who weren't threatened by race or gender or sexuality. It was the working class artists who shaped their own thriving communities and could peacefully coexist. But eventually capital caught up. Capital saw potential for more capital. Now capital is moving so fast, there are heated debates in places like Boyle Heights in LA, Barrio Logan here in San Diego, two long-standing communities largely comprised of a strong Latino culture. Unused spaces were starting to turn into artist showcases. But capital had learned that artists moving into a community could simply be a backdoor, that art could be a ruse to move into an area and buy out cheap property, only to raise it and bring in bigger business and raise the overall, excuse me, raise the overall property value of a neighborhood. And then displacement starts happening. And now the debate is around the notion of galleries moving into neighborhoods, especially galleries that don't represent the area and its existing culture. And now the modern artist community is facing this huger conundrum in which its former means of sustainability has been taken away, in which the artist is watching its former working class neighbors booted from their homes as high-end culture moves in. We're all now facing this idea of value, the value of art, the value of community, as a collective working class, artists and mechanics and cooks and musicians alike, we're at the mercy of valuation, a greedy opportunistic developer seeing resources, in this case property, and taking what they can, a modern version of Western colonialism. So as a now 37 year old kid who spent years enjoying the coexistence, interaction with people from other working class cultures, who has a strong love for the idea of identity and freedom of expression, and for people being who they are, as long as they're not encroaching upon anyone else's idea of these things, I can tell you that I really don't know what to do, except not to buy in. This year piece, this is basically an updated rant I've been yelling the last few years, as I've watched my artist friends from around the country booted from their neighborhoods in the face of new development. And I can tell you that a lot of people in that community and the working class community at large are just at a massive loss. That the steamroller of capital and homogenization is really, really affecting us all. But in all this, there is hope. Here in San Diego, the powers that be recently proposed yet another stadium. After Petco Park moved in and changed the landscape of downtown to favor developers and money people, failing to provide for the homeless population, turning a blind eye to displacement, the city wanted to build yet another taxpayer-funded park that would push its way into Barrio Logan, changing the landscape of a proud, long-standing Latino culture. Last November, Prophecy was put up for a vote, and you people voted. And you know what you said? Fuck you. <laughs> that guy was saying it before I said it. <laughs> Fuck you, developers. Fuck you, money-grabbing, culture-destroying, Luxury apartment building, community displacing, ivory tower motherfuckers, only looking out for more capital, forever willing to push out those who aren't part of your personal game. Fuck you for trying to destroy my way of life, my family that I work hard for, my heritage. Fuck you for not caring about the hopes and dreams of the working class upon whose backs you are built. So hopefully you're all included in this, you're starting to rise up. You're starting to understand the institutions in this country that actively work against you. You started to make your voices heard. And it's something that this weirdo, punker, 37-year-old kid really loves to see. Thanks.